Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Manga Historian. My name is Benny, I run multiple YouTube channels, and as a part-time fun thing, I like to read manga, which includes One Piece. I've been catching up on One Piece now for about a year and a half, and I'm reading the manga, not watching the anime, meaning some of the pronunciations might be off, or I might not have some of your favorite filler. I write a bunch of notes as to what I've read, and then I discuss it here with my Manga Historian viewers. Today we're gonna to be doing chapters 903 to, I don't remember where I ended, it's like 915 or something weird like that. So 903 to, who knows? This picks up right after the whole cake arc, which I gave you my opinion of. This is the arc and the beginning of Wano. So just to kind of narrow down exactly what is going on. I have finally made it to Wano. I also understand the joke of, I'll see you in Wano, because everyone says it to each other and they will eventually get to Wano. So kicking it all off, right at the beginning, I found it kind of interesting. Sanji's arguing with the cloud. So if you don't remember what happened in this particular segment, one of Big Mom's cloud people things that she put part of her soul into, Nami has taken control of, and Sanji is upset because that cloud gets to touch Nami, and he wants to touch Nami, which I thought was just a hilarious little Sanji moment to have. We then get to see everybody's bounty has gone up, and I love the fact that Luffy can't do numbers. Count numbers? Look at numbers, because he really just looked at them. He thought his bounty went down to 150,000 berries, and basically everyone else got bigger bounties than him, only to discover that there was more zeros than he could count, because it was 1.5 billion berries after everything. Uh, we also have the loose announcement, I think? I don't know if it's official or not, because it doesn't seem like it's official, but that Luffy's being considered the fifth emperor at this point, because of all the shenanigans he's had, you know, like, just uh, just the stuff, and uh, Sanji's keeping his raid suit, which he didn't really use, if I don't remember. I don't, I remember him getting it, I don't remember him using it in the whole cake arc, but either way, he has the raid suit still. We then cut to what is the reverie, or levelly, I've been told that it's like, because of the translation, it gets a little weird, but we move over to that, which is basically showing all of the kings, princesses, and emperors of the world are now moving to the new Marine Ford, which is kind of funny because Marine Ford is here, and then we had the town in the middle, and then, which I think is Saba Odi, but either way, it's Marine Ford, the town in the middle, and then they just put Marine Ford on the other side. They're like, we, we don't want to go very far, we're just going to put it over there now. So, Marine Ford went over to that side, and everyone is arriving. So, we get to get what I, what I wrote in my notes here, a who's who of One Piece adventures. Everyone from Vivi comes back to Wimpy Hoshi, a.k.a. Shiro Hoshi. Uh, we get to see everyone from Fishman Island. Everyone who is royalty or controls things begins to arrive at this event. And the story kind of pivots towards that. And as you, if you've been watching these videos for a while, know... When they throw a dozen characters at me, it becomes very difficult for me to keep track of who's who and what's going on. This particular sequence, though, I did enjoy because it was the princesses all getting to know each other. We had, I think her name's Rebecca from Dressrosa. We had Shirahoshi and we had Vivi, which I remembered all of them, going off and doing princess stuff, getting ready for their appearances. What was interesting was that Charlos had showed back up. Well, hold on. There's one thing I want to mention before we get to Charlos, and that's that they all got onto a magical floor that seemingly moved without them, only to discover it's more of the Marine Ford bullshit because the slaves are beneath the floor moving it along. I put that in there because I really wanted to talk about that. I also uh, need to mention that Sabo's brother, Sabo? Yeah, Sabo's brother apparently became the actual royalty that Sabo was supposed to become, and now Sabo has sneaked into the Levelly Reverie and he's like the guard to his brother who can't do anything. I also remember there being a fun little Easter egg. At least I took it as an Easter egg, a, a little joke. But they get into these elevators and the elevators go riding up the wall. And Sabo's brother is terrified because he heard rumors that inside the wall are giants. And that immediately made me think of Attack on Titan. <laughs> so I was like, yes, I get where you're going with this. And if that's not where you're going with this, I still thought it was funny. So anyway, we go a little bit forward, everyone's getting to know each other, we get to see all the princesses, all the people in charge, everyone doing the thing, and what we eventually come across is Charlos. Charlos is the celestial dragon who every time he shows up demands that whatever's going on is his now. He was in One Piece Red trying to kidnap Uda. He was all the way back trying to kidnap the original mermaid that caused all the issues. Charlos is like this reoccurring stupid villain. But he shows up and decides he wants the biggest mermaid in the world to be in his possession, Shirahoshi. And he's going to kidnap Shirahoshi. And it becomes this big incident, which I got very interested in. Sabo is just off doing a different thing. He's, I think... It, 
At this point, they're just showing you Sabo is there because he hasn't done anything. But Shirahoshi is now being taken by the Celestial Dragons, which by the law of the Celestial Dragons, in which they can do anything that they want, Shirahoshi's being kidnapped. So then it turns into the princesses are trying to fight against the Celestial Dragons, but they're told not to do anything. The, the king is told that he want, is basically going to start a war with the humans to get his daughter back because of course he is. Like, it just shows you how stupid Charlos is and how stupid the Celestial Dragons are that they're willing to start a war because they just want to have the world's biggest mermaid. But in an interesting turn, and I found this really interesting, the Celestial Dragon who crash land on Fishman Island, and if I remember correctly, and I might be off on this, but killed Otohime, uh, the mother, with a gun that he was trying to like just show, he basically beats up Charlos and is like, I'm making a tone for what I did. I apologize. I learned my lesson with Onihime. And I will protect you from the other celestial dragons. They will not be able to go against me. And I will walk with you. And I will make sure that this goes without a hitch. And I was shocked because that was the whole point of his character. That this celestial dragon caused so many problems for Fishman Island. That now he learned his lesson and he's there with them. I was like, this is, I like this twist. This was a really good twist. Um, we also had a character, which I... Pseudo spoiled for myself, I'll admit it, because I had no idea who it was, and I thought I'd missed something. The character, I think it's Emu? Emu? It's I-M-U, so Imu or Emu, or one of those. But apparently he's the big bad of One Piece? Like, he is the bad guy. And it's kind of implied that he's the guy that's been manipulating everything, but they didn't name him outright. No, they did name him outright, but they didn't say who he was or what he was, and I thought I missed something. So I checked the wiki only to discover the first paragraph, which said he is the big bad of One Piece who has been manipulating everything. And I'm like, oh, I should stop reading here. <laughs> so I stopped reading right there. So that's all I know. But I thought I missed something. Hence why I was like, let me see what I missed. Because there was no note for him on the, the chapter synopsis. There was no note for him everywhere, but he seemed very important. And I was like, okay, I, I won't read any more of the wiki. I don't think I should. Uh, if he's the big bad, I should probably leave it alone. <laughs> so the big bad has officially arrived. Now, another really interesting factor. We finally get to see Bartholomew Kuma. Real Bartholomew Kuma which I was very interested about because he's being treated as like a slave where they're riding him, which is just like, I thought he was a robot. I thought all of his humanity was ripped out. Is this that Kuma? Is Kuma just like the actual Kuma over here? What is going on? They very heavily are just telling you like, hey, Kuma's a prisoner. Moving on. Uh, I believe like the rest of like Sabo's crew is like, oh my God, we have to save Kuma. That's really all that comes out of it. Just the intrigue of what is going on with Kuma. Um, so after all of this goes down and all this interesting, like I said, who's who of One Piece characters popping back up, what I got really excited about was we finally went to Wano after what I think was 150 chapters of, hey, we're going to Wano. As a reader, we finally went to Wano to see what everyone had been doing at Wano. And everyone got a job. Except Zoro. Zoro is currently captured and been told to, ca to, con uh, to, to do seppuku. I think it's seppuku. I think it's how you pronounce it. On himself for his crimes. Uh, and his response was to slash all the guards with the tiny dagger and then run away. So Zoro is now a ronin while everyone else has a job. And I thought that was going to be the end of it. Because then we cut to Luffy and crew. They crash land on Wano. Wano. Luffy is separated. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we're going to start the Wano adventure finally. Okay, we know that, you know, Zoro's on the run. Everyone has a job. And the rest of the crew has been separated from, from Luffy. And he meets a girl named Tama. And I've never cared so much about a little girl in this story more quickly than Tama. Okay, because Tama is the sweetest thing known to mankind. First off, Luffy saves her. And so as a response, she wants to go and get Luffy lunch. And I'm like, okay, cool. Standard Luffy bullshit. He's going to go eat food. He'll be rude about it. Blah, blah, blah. She makes him a bowl of two cups of rice and he eats it immediately. And he's like, is there more? 
And then I found it weird because her response was, I mean, I could make more, but I don't really have it. And I, this is all I had. And she makes it very sad that she made like the last of her rice for Luffy. And I'm like, oh, but Luffy, I, I give him credit. He saw what was going on, apologized immediately and was like, okay. I'm like, oh, cool, cool. We're just, we're a little sad. Tom is being sad about it. But then I even wrote in my notes. I just want everyone to know. I wrote in my notes, meeting Tama, the nicest girl in the entire world. And she gave Luffy the last of her food. But here's where, so another guy shows up who I believe is the blacksmith of the town that they're in, the one that got destroyed because they're in, because it's been destroyed by poison. And the blacksmith asks why Luffy is eating the rice. And I'm like, okay, so it's just like the rice was the, the blacksmith's? No. Tama saves the rice up every year to have rice on her birthday. And it is her birthday. And she just gave all of it to Luffy for saving her life. And then she's in tears with the blacksmith because he's like, you just ate her birthday rice. And she's like, no, I wanted to give it to him because she thinks that pirates are nice. Then I'm already heartbroken at that because they established that she is eight years old. That this eight-year-old girl just gave the last of her food for her birthday to Luffy. I'm already heartbroken. Only then to discover she knows Ace. Ace came through the area and, and Ace came through and he was teaching her, but she was only five at the time. And Ace said, I will come back for you to take you as a pirate when you get older. So then Luffy doesn't establish that he's the brother of Ace. But he tells her that Ace died, which makes her so much more upset because you find out that she's been waiting for Ace to come back and take her away from this poisoned town that she has been living in because the town got poisoned and died away once Ace left and they have no food and they have no water and she is just hoping Ace is going to save her. And Luffy ruins it for her and then is like, I will go get food. I will go get her meat. I will bring back food only to then discover everything in the area is poisoned and he can't get any food for her. And I'm just sitting here like, oh my God, this poor girl. Oh my God. So Luffy in Luffy fashion is like, who's causing the poison? I'll start there. And just storms off to go fix the problem. And I thought I would end the read there so that I could then go into like, do my video. But I was like, I got to read one more chapter. What happens to Tama? What happens with it? And then he's crossing the, the wastelands. And this, I loved this moment to bring back levity to the story. Because at this point, I'm heartbroken. I want this girl to be saved. I want them to put her on the crew. Get her off the island. She doesn't need to be here anymore. He goes out and he discovers somebody fighting various beasts in this area who is it Zoro on the run from the town Luffy and Zoro team up and he, Luffy's like I gotta get her food I'm assuming the enemy base has some good food and Zoro's like what are you talking about there's water and creatures all over here and Luffy's like no they're poison and Zoro goes that's why my stomach hurts let's go get the base <laughs> I'm like <laughs> of course Zoro's mildly affected by the poison. Like, he's not really affected by the poison. And then, to end this chapter, and to end everything, I was like, okay, cool. All right, cool. So they're gonna go fight this. Zoro's like, Zoro or Luffy, one of them's like, Kinemon, the, the sam I think that's how I'm pronouncing it. I don't know if it's right or wrong, because I haven't seen him in the anime yet, so I don't know how it's said. But the, the samurai that they met all the way back on Punk Hazard, that they've been dragging along with them, and they discovered the whole plot. They're like, Kinemon told us to not make a fuss. Don't make a problem. And Luffy's like, no, we're going to go defeat that base, and we'll just apologize to him later. <laughs> and that's where I ended my chapters. Because I was like, okay. I didn't really have a lot to talk about with the who's who of One Piece. But that, that like three-chapter Thomas segment just touched me so much. I'm so ready to what's... Don't... I, my producer's looking at me weird. It's I said it weird. He's looking at me weird. It, it was heartwarming. Is that better? Is that worded better? Either way, I wanted to talk about that, and I can't wait to see what's going to happen next in Wano. So I thank you guys for watching today's video. Thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, we took a little bit of a break. I was on a break. I was taking a couple weeks off of doing anything just to kind of catch up on sleep and catch up on other things. But now we're back to it. I'm going to be reading volume one of Go Go Loser Ranger. I've already read up all my Black Clover. We're going to be talking about that real soon. And Dan and I are bringing back Dub Degenerates. It should already be out by the time you watch this episode. But we should be back into the normal rotation here at Manga Storian. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. And I'll see you next time right here.